We've been looking at Satipatthana, looking at mindfulness and its practice. And in the mornings, we've been going over different aspects of the practice. And tonight, we'll do an overview of the whole system. We talked about the meaning of Satipatthana. It's a compound word. It can be broken down into Sati and Upatana or Sati and Patana. Where it is Upatana, that means the practice itself of mindfulness, the practice of establishing mindfulness or applying mindfulness or setting up mindfulness. And so sometimes you see Satipatthana translated as the establishments of mindfulness or the applications of mindfulness. Where it's Satipatthana, it represents what we are mindful of, where we put our mindfulness. So this would be the foundations of mindfulness or the domains of mindfulness. Tonight we're looking at it in that second meaning, the foundations of mindfulness. Of course, everything revolves around sati, mindfulness. And we talked about mindfulness. The word sati literally means memory. Mindfulness is remembering, remembering the present rather than the past. The opposite of mindfulness is forgetting. And when we try to be continuously aware throughout the day, we notice that what happens, what stops us from being continuously aware is that we keep forgetting. We keep forgetting to be aware or we keep forgetting what we are aware of. And when we forget, the mind slips off and it goes somewhere else and we are caught up in something and we don't know that we are caught up. And it's this not knowing which is delusion. If we know what is going on, then that's not delusion. It's the difference, for example, between let's say walking meditation, knowing that I'm walking and at the same time thinking, but knowing that I'm thinking. There I'm being mindful. There's walking, there's seeing, there's hearing, there's thinking. And I'm mindful of that. I maintain an awareness of that. But then I might suddenly forget that I'm walking because I'm completely caught up in the thought. I don't know that I'm walking. And then I remember, oh, I'm walking. And I look back and I realise I don't remember the last so many metres. Completely forgotten. That is the loss of mindfulness. The loss of mindfulness is found in that forgetting. What we're training ourselves to do is to remember our experience and we are remembering body, feeling, mind, phenomena. These are the four satipatthanas, the four foundations of mindfulness. And together they cover everything, all aspects of experience. One of the basic principles that we have is that in this practice it does not matter what we are mindful of. What matters is the mindfulness. And we easily forget that. We think that we're supposed to have certain kinds of experiences and not others. Often people think that in meditation I am not supposed to think. So if I'm thinking I must be failing, I, I'm not meditating. But thinking is part of the mind, citta. It's just another foundation of mindfulness. It's something else to be mindful of. The first foundation is body, kaya, and we've been talking about body a lot. When the Buddha talks about body, he will talk about it in two ways. In body in a broad sense and body in a narrow sense. So first of all, the Buddha is always interested in the nature of experience. 
I think we talked about this earlier in the retreat. The Buddha is not a scientist. He's not interested in a scientific view of the world. The view of the world that he is interested in is the world as we experience it, or the experience of the world. For example, not here, certainly, but let's say in most of Australia, if you look at the Earth, it's flat. Now we know that the world is round. But certainly in Australia, most of the time, when you look at it, it's very flat. So which is right? This can create a conflict. In the early teachings and also elaborated throughout the tradition, there is a cosmology which is taught the nature of the world. Now, according to Buddhist teaching, the world is flat. It consists of four continents, one to the north, one to the south, one to the east, one to the west. In the centre is a big mountain called Mount Meru. And up the top of this mountain, the gods live. And the Buddha lived in the southern continent, the rose apple continent. And surrounding these four continents was a great ocean. And surrounding the great ocean, holding it all together, was a great wind. And if you go underneath the earth, you get to the hell realms. And if you ascended up the central mountain and went further, you'd go up into the heavens. Many years ago, I was a monk in Thailand and I was staying at a study monastery in the north, in Lampang. And most of the people in the monastery were young novices who were doing the traditional Burmese study. This is a, a medieval curriculum, everything memorised. And one afternoon we are doing our afternoon sweeping and one of the monks came up with a novice and the novice did not speak any English. The other monk is a friend of mine. He spoke some English, I spoke some Thai, so we used to communicate. And uh, my friend comes up and he says, this novice monk has a question that he wants to ask you. And I said, go ahead. And my friend turns to the novice, they speak together in Thai, and my friend turns to me and he says, is the world round or flat? And I thought about this, and I said, it's round. So my friend turns to the novice and explains it to him, and the novice looks very agitated, and he goes, blah, 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 in Thai, and my friend turns to me and he says, prove it. And I thought, hmm. And I said, photographs. I've seen photographs. I don't have them here, but I'm sure they are available. People have been up there, and they've looked down, and they've taken photographs, and it is round. And this was explained to the novice, and he looked very upset and walked away. Now, he was being taught this traditional curriculum about the flat earth, the continents, the wind, etc. And suddenly he hears rumours from beyond the monastery walls that maybe it's not like this. And suddenly he's got two world views that he's got to somehow reconcile. We know from a scientific point of view who is right. We know that the Buddha is wrong. If we want to learn geography, we don't go to the Buddha. If you want to learn about the nature of human experience, we go to the Buddha. That's what he teaches. That's what it's about. He looks out at the world, and the world that he is interested in is the world as it is experienced. As human beings, we experience the world through the six senses, i.e. nose, tongue, body, mind. A fly or a mosquito lives in a very different world from ours, because their senses are completely different. Their sense of time is completely different. Every other species, you could say, lives in a different kind of world, because their senses show them a world which is different 
from the senses that our world that shows itself to us. It's this experienced world that the Buddha is talking about. How do we experience the world? We experience the world through these six senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, minding. These first five senses are body. So when the Buddha says body, in, if he's speaking in a broad sense, he means the five physical senses. Everything we see, everything we hear, smell, taste, touch. Body in the narrow sense is the fifth sense, which is a sensitivity to touch, external and internal. External, I can feel the weight of my body against the cushion. Internal, after I eat lunch, I feel very full. There's a pressure inside the belly. If I'm hungry, I feel empty. But all of these are experiences of touch. So the first foundation covers all the five physical senses, everything that takes place in the five physical senses. This morning we were doing exercises in particular in seeing and hearing. And these are very good for cultivating mindfulness. It's not that we have to pretend that we don't see, rather we have to note seeing. That's the distinction. Not getting caught up in what we see, but being interested in the act of seeing itself. If you look at the different meditation methods, they emphasize body in the narrow sense of the fifth of the five physical senses the sensitivity to touch. And it's no accident that this is emphasised. For example, in the sitting following the breathing, this is body in this narrow sense, internal touch. In the walking meditation, the movement of the body and the contact on the ground, external touch and, and movement. The body has two major advantages as a meditation object. Uh, the first one we've already talked about. The body is always now. The body is always experienced in the present. It is impossible to experience the body in the past. We just can't do it. It is impossible to experience the body in the future. We just can't do it. When we experience the body, we experience it now. Always. So the classic example would be if I'm walking down the steps lost in thinking about tomorrow and suddenly I fall down the steps. Bang. When I hit the, the ground, bang. Is that tomorrow? No. Nope. <laughs> tomorrow, gone. It's right now. The body has that quality of always being in the present and which makes it a very good meditation object. Because to come back to the body is to come back to the present. The second aspect of body in this fifth sense, the narrow sense of touch, is that body is very clear. The experience of body. The Buddha talks about experience as contact in Pali, passa, which literally means touch. Let's say with hearing, there's movement in the air, there's what we call sound waves, and they strike the body. There's two parts of the body which are sensitive to these particular waves. They strike those parts of the body, the ears, they impact against the body and we hear sound. The sense object strikes the sense sensitivity. Bim! And something happens. Now, according to the, the later tradition, the impact of visual form striking the eye, sound striking the ear, odours striking the nose, flavours striking the tongue, these impacts are like cotton striking cotton. The impact of tactile object striking the body is like a hammer 
hitting an anvil. Wham! It's powerful. It's very strong. And so the meditation methods tend to favour this physicality as a meditation object because it's powerful, it's strong. And one of the things that gives rise to mindfulness is a strong perception. If the experience is strong, it's easy to be mindful of it. The body is the foundation because it's always in the present and in the case of touch, it's strong. So we can develop mindfulness through it. The next foundation is Vedana, feeling. We've talked about Vedana is as similar to the flavour of food. Vedana is like the flavour of experience. It's like every experience comes to us flavoured in some way. If we're eating lunch, there's a whole series of physical sensations involved. Crunchiness, smoothness, wetness, dryness, heaviness, lightness, and so on. And there's also the flavour. Now, the flavour is not the physical sensation, and the physical sensation is not the flavour, but they're intimately bound up. And it is the flavour that moves us. So I get up to take more. What gets me up is the flavour. Feeling is like the flavour of experience. Every experience has a flavour. And it's this which moves us, which provokes a response. This is what we've called affect. In English, you might say, I was very affected by this. I was moved by this experience. Something happened and I responded. Feeling is the whole area of response. We've seen contact as something striking a sensitivity. When something strikes a sensitivity, there's a response. Something happens. And the Buddha says the three basic responses are attraction, aversion and delusion. Something strikes and I like it. The mind will go out to get hold of it. Or something strikes and I don't like it and the mind will resist or try to get rid of it. Or something strikes and I don't know whether I like it or not. And so either I just don't don't even notice it or if I notice it, I don't know what to do. Should I grab it? Should I reject it? Hold it, reject it, hold it, reject it. So the first one is attraction from which comes all forms of desire. The second one is aversion, from which comes all form of anger and sorrow, and even emotions like boredom. And the third one is delusion, which can be either ignorance, I just don't see it at all, or confusion, I don't know what to do. Should I... Hold it, should I reject it, hold it, reject it, hold, reject, do, 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 do. don't know, don't know, don't know. You have these three basic movements, attraction, aversion, delusion, and these are based on the three basic flavours of pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. Vedana is the realm, this whole area. Vedana is important because it's about our responses to experience. It's about how we respond, what we do about something. Action begins with Vedana, with feeling. I like it, so I'll do something about it. I'll try to get more. I don't like it, so I will do something about it. I'll try to get rid of it. Now this is important because this takes us into the whole world of ethics, of how we live. We're constantly making choices about how we live. And what is it that drives those choices? We want to be happy. We don't want to be in pain. We make a whole series of choices to try to improve our 
sense of well-being and a whole series of choices to avoid painful experience. And what this comes down to is the pleasant, the painful, the neither painful nor pleasant. We feel first and then we act. Action comes from feeling. We are struck by something and we are moved to respond. And that movement in its fundamental sense is feeling. Getting to know feeling takes us into the realm of how we live, the realm of ethical sensitivity. What choices do I make? How do I make them? Why do I make them? And this is, of course, very important. In the basic formula for dependent arising, the Buddha says, feeling conditions craving, craving conditions clinging. Contact conditions feeling. If there's an experience, there is already feeling. There is already a response. I am already responding. Feeling conditions craving. And we talked about craving last night. I am driven. I want to avoid the pain that I feel. I want something else. And craving conditions clinging. He clinging means the construction of a whole identity around this. I become a person who lives in a certain kind of way because I want certain things, I don't want other things. And that determines my whole life. When we start to look at this whole realm of feeling, of the way that we respond, we start to see how it is that we live, what kind of choices that we make, what drives our life. We're in this realm of ethical sensitivity. And this is important because why is it that we do this practice in the first place? We do it because we want to change the way that we live. We're not satisfied with the way that we live. We want to live better. Now some people will take up meditation practice because they're very discontented with the way that they live. They feel life is terrible and I've got to do something about it. Other people take up meditation practice because they, their life is pretty good. They just want it to be a little bit better. That's all. Motivation greatly varies. But always it's a sense of discontent that brings us to a place like this. We start to look at how do I respond? What is it that moves me? And what does it move me toward? So we start examining the way that we live at a very kind of microscopic level in the meditation practice. But it starts to open up in the daily activities and especially, of course, when we go back home. This ethical sensitivity begins with the second foundation. It begins with feeling. It's completely absent in the first one the contemplation of the body. We can develop an acute physical sensitivity and intelligence, but it might have no impact at all on the way that we live. When I teach in Australia, the example I always give is in sports, because Australians love sports. And one of the favourite topics of the mass media is scandals in the sports world. Sports stars behave in very, very badly. The media loves it, and the sports stars always provide more material for them, so there's never any shortage. I'm sure it never happens in Malaysia. I'm sure Malaysian sports people are much better behaved. You can have someone who, in playing a sport, has a highly developed physical intelligence. They have great physical sensitivity, if they're playing certain kinds of games, they'll have great spatial sensitivity. They're on a field in a team of, say, a dozen people, and they're facing another team, say, a dozen people, and all of them are running around at top speed. The really top players, they just know where everybody is on that field at any time. 
and they know that if I pass the ball at this angle, at this speed, then so-and-so is going to be there to catch it. Although intellectually there's no time to figure it out. It's just impossible to figure it out. But they just know. They've got this highly developed physical intelligence. Yet when they get off the field, they behave incredibly stupidly. It just doesn't follow them. That intelligence doesn't apply to the way that they live. You can also see it in people who do yoga, hatha yoga, the physical exercises. People can develop an acute sensitivity to the body, an extraordinary ability to move any part of the body that they want to at will. And yet, you look at the way that they live, and in terms of enlightenment, nothing, absolutely nothing. And the reason is because there is no ethical sensitivity in body awareness. It's just body. The ethical sensitivity begins with feeling because that's where the response begins. We use the body as the foundation and from that we move into the realm of feeling and then we begin to see the way that we respond to experience. The third foundation is citta, usually translated mind. This translation can be very misleading. One of the problems that we have is that the Buddha has a, a technical language and often there is no English equivalent for the words that he uses. Dukkha is a very good example. There is no English word that corresponds to Dukkha. None of them are actually right. In the case of citta, usually people would translate it as mind. But most people, certainly in Australia, if you ask them, well, where is the mind? They'd say, well, it's up here. What does it do? Uh, well, it thinks. It's true that for the Buddha, the citta is what thinks, but thinking is a very minor activity of the citta. The chitta does a lot more than just think. The Buddha certainly doesn't say it's up here. He would not locate it here at all. In Australia, we also would talk about the heart. So the heart is the area of emotion. The head, the mind, is the area of reason and thinking. You have the realm of emotion and the realm of reason. Mind is the realm of reason heart is the realm of feeling, of emotion. And these are often at war with each other. For the Buddha, citta covers both. It's both what's up here, the thinking, and it's down here, the feeling. It's both are included in citta. Also, in the European tradition, the mind is regarded as radically separate from the body. Uh, but for the Buddha, the body and the citta are always intertwined. So that if you have a body, you have a citta. If you have a citta, you have a body. You can't actually separate them. Remembering that when we talk about body, we mean the experience of the body. So a living body. If there's a living body, there's a citta. If there's a citta, there's a living body. So that body and citta are intertwined. Citta is an important technical term and in the, in the tradition it gets different definitions depending on the context. In the context of Satipatthana, the Buddha does not give a precise definition. Rather, he talks about it in general terms as like the inner space within which we experience We could say that there's some aspects of our experience which are public. For example, seeing. We're all seeing this hall. And if we got together and talked about it, we would probably all agree about what we're seeing. Probably no one would argue and say, no, 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 the hall is completely different from the way you're describing it. So there's a, there's a public aspect to seeing. Each individual's seeing is slightly different, but overall we agree there's a public aspect to this. 
But then there's an internal world each one of us has, which is completely private. Chitta is the inner space, the space inside of us, where we have a whole realm of experience which is private. My thoughts are inside, but what I see is outside. Chitta is this inner world. If we are wanting to know what is the state of our chitta, uh, roughly we could say it's how I am at this time. The example I like to give is in, in English when we meet someone, a standard greeting would be, how are you? And usually people just say, good. But let's say someone met you and they said, how are you? And you stopped, went into a meditative state, went inside, examined that inner state, decided what it was and came out with the answer. What you would be presenting would be your chitta. Now let's say someone else asks you the same question 15 minutes later. You do the same thing. You might give a completely different answer. The chitta is impermanent. It's always changing. The chitta is bound up with the body, yet it's not the body. We experience it within ourselves. It's our inner realm of sensitivity and subjectivity and it's constantly changing. When the Buddha talks about tracking the citta, the first thing he talks about is recognizing whether the citta is colored by attraction or by aversion or by delusion. Right now, what's moving it? What's coloring it? Is it desire in some form? Is it resistance or rejection in some form? Or is it delusion? Don't know. So when we practice and we start to get sensitive to the state of the citta, and this takes us even deeper into the whole realm of ethical sensitivity. What is it that determines how we live? It's the citta. If the citta is predominantly driven by desire, we will live a certain kind of life. If the citta is predominantly driven by aversion, we will live a certain kind of life. If the citta is predominantly driven by love, we will live a certain kind of life. And so on. The state of the citta, our inner state, conditions for the kind of life that we lead. We go from feeling, which opens up the whole realm of ethical sensitivity, and from there we go into citta, in which this whole world gets a lot bigger and more complex, and our understanding becomes much more sophisticated. And this is absolutely central, because this is what changes the way that we live. We get to know our inner state. We get to know how it works. We start to see why we behave the way that we behave. And we get a chance to change it, because now we understand it. We also get to understand others, because we can recognise they are driven in the same way that we are. They respond to the same sorts of things in very similar ways. So we also, in understanding our own inner state, we understand others as well. And it's this which makes the transformation of the way that we live possible. When the Buddha talks about liberation, what is it that is liberated? It's the citta. When he talks about bondage, being imprisoned, what is it that is imprisoned? It's the citta. Getting to know the citta, understanding the citta, is absolutely central. Now how do we do this? How do we find our way into this world? Especially since some of us, have, in the way that we've lived, have spent a lot of energy avoiding going in there. We don't want to look. Often people are quite shocked when they start to meditate at what's happening in their minds. First of all, they begin to realise that the citta is out of control. And of course, if the chitta is out of control, that means I'm out of control. 
and that's a worry. And then they see most of the time the chitta is possessed by bizarre desires and aversions and so on. It, gets, it can be quite scary watching our chitta. It can be quite a relief that no one else can see it. This is what we work with. We have to get in there and get to know it intimately well. But how? How do we get there? Well, we can't force our way in. We can't make ourselves go in there. It's not like breaking down a door to get in. And we can't think our way in. We can think about it endlessly, but it's not going to do any good. When we get caught up in thought in the meditation practice, we stay at the surface of things, always. Thought is always at the surface. Some people spend their meditation re retreats thinking about their problems, even solving them. It's a complete waste of time because all of it is just on the surface. It's not getting deep down. But how do we get there? How do we get in? We get in through Vedana, through feeling. We feel our way into the chitta. The Vedana gives us the entry point inside. Also with the body. We want to become intimate with the body. But how do we do it? How do we get in? We can't force our way in through willpower. We can't think our way in. We feel our way into the body. Vedana is the hinge. Vedana or feeling holds the whole thing together. So we have body, feeling, heart, mind, chitta. At the centre is Vedana. So it's through feeling that we go into deep into the body and deep into the heart-mind. Feeling is absolutely central. We have it listed, body, feeling, chitta. And one of the reasons why it's listed that way is, is it's listed from the most gross, the most obvious, to the most subtle. But another way of looking at it is to look at that, those three and to see in the centre is Vedana, and Vedana is holding the other two together, making up a little system. So you can imagine it as a triangle. Here's feeling, and here's body, and heart-mind. And it's Vedana that holds those two together. We feel our way into the experience of body and of mind. When we look at those first three foundations of mindfulness, we can see that we've covered all bases. Body, mind, everything. So what is the fourth foundation? What's that doing there? This fourth one, when you look at the translations, have the widest variety of translations. Sometimes it seems like a basic disagreement about what exactly this fourth one is about. And this is because of an ambiguity in the Pali. Each one of these foundations is an anupasana, a tracking. Kaya anupasana, Vedana anupasana, Chitta anupasana. So the tracking of body, the tracking of feeling, the tracking of heart-mind. And the fourth one is a compound word, Dhamma anupasana. Now this compound has two meanings. It can be Dhamma Anupasana or Dhamma Anupasana according to Pali grammar. Now the difference between Dhamma and Dhamma is like in English the difference be between putting an S at the end of a word or not putting an S at the end of the word. So if you have glass and you put an S at the end of the word you have glasses, plural. If you have the word Dhamma and you make it Dhamma, you make it plural, Dhammas. This fourth one is the contemplation of the Dhamma, singular, or the contemplation of Dhammas, plural. And it has a different meaning depending on which one. Let's have a look at the first one, the, the tracking of the Dhamma. When you look at the Buddha's teaching, he provides us with a basic framework
for the nature of human experience. All the teachings together, they create this whole way of looking at how we experience ourselves and our world. When we do the practice, what are we doing? We're going in and we're looking at the nature of experience. We're looking at this experience, that experience, the other experience, boom, boom, boom. And it's pretty chaotic. There's all these different things. How do we make sense out of it? In English we have the expression to join the dots, meaning to understand the pattern of things. Imagine that you have a big blank sheet of paper and you have a a brush with black ink and you put a dot on the paper. And then somewhere else you put another dot. And somewhere else you put another dot. Somewhere else you put another dot. And you keep doing that over a period of time. And then at some point you step back and you connect all those dots and you see a pattern. Suddenly there's a picture there that comes about through the patterns of all these dots. When we meditate, we have an experience. And then we have another experience. And we have another one. And another one. Later on, another one. And at some point we step back and we realise, oh, they're all connected. And they mean something. So what the Buddha gives us in his teaching is a way of making meaning out of our experience. Sometimes people think that the purpose of meditation is to get some kind of spectacular experience. But it isn't. Some meditators do have big spectacular experiences. Other meditators have very boring, ordinary experiences. Neither of that is important. What's important is what do these experiences mean. For example, when uh, Buddhism came to the West, it arrived basically in the 60s along with the drug culture. I remember when I spent two years in Hawaii practicing Zen with the Diamond Sangha. I don't know if any of you have gone to Hawaii, but it is paradise. It's an amazing place. And I was told a story by one of the older members Originally, this Zen center was the house of Robert and Anne Aitken. And Robert Aitken eventually became a Zen teacher, recognized Zen teacher. But before that happened, he was just Bob Aitken, and he used to run a meditation group in his living room once a week. People would come and do Zen meditation. And very few people came. There was plenty of room in the living room for everybody. And usually older people, middle-aged, respectable people. Then one day, it's the meeting time, he opens the door, and there's all these people here who he's never seen before, and they're young. All these young people have turned up to meditate. So what to do? He brings them in, and the room's quite crowded, and grabs as many cushions as he can, and teaches them how to meditate, and they have the meeting, and they leave, and he thinks, phew, that was a fluke. Next week, there's even more of them. And he has to open up the doors to the dining room and expand into the dining room. And the next week, they're still coming. And it was just like overnight, suddenly, there was this thriving meditation community and most of these new people were young. Why did they suddenly start coming? And my friend was explaining, he said, the reason was, is because the week before all these people turned up, was the time that the first shipment of LSD hit Honolulu. That was the difference. (laughs) People would start taking the drug, and what it did for people back in in the 60s was all these young people who thought the world was a certain way, and they take this substance, and suddenly they realize, oh, there's a lot more going on. And whammo, something is happening. Now, if you want a spectacular experience, you don't have to spend a lot of time sitting on a hard floor working in order to get it. You can go and buy one. But there's plenty of people who have had some kind of spectacular mind-opening experience but has it improved the way that they live. 
In many cases, no. In some cases, it's made life a lot worse. They've become addicted and it's even destroyed them. In some cases, it's made no difference at all. It's just, when I was young, I, had, I did these crazy things. I remember on the full moon night at Goa on the beach and I was one with the whole cosmos. That was fun. And I'm telling my fellow lawyers this 20 years later and we're having a quiet joke, drinking good quality red wine. It doesn't change the way that we live. An experience will change the way that we live if it means something. Let's talk about meditation experiences. Some people will have a sudden dramatic experience when they're meditating and suddenly, boom, the world is completely different. And it can result in people going crazy. People can think, well, I've, I've gone mad. Sometimes in the, in the interview room, you know, one of the questions people ask is, they describe something and they say, am I going mad? <laughs> and I feel very tempted to say, yes. <laughs> but so far I haven't. <laughs> People can have some kind of profound experience, very upsetting, they can't function. They might go to a doctor who immediately prescribes antidepressants, might be sent to a psychiatrist, they're prescribed antipsychotic drugs, and they might spend the rest of their lives drugged, convinced they've got some kind of mental illness, when actually what they've seen is some completely new aspect of reality. For example, painful experiences. Sometimes people are meditating or even not meditating and suddenly they recognise what the Buddha calls Dukkha Lakana, the universal characteristic of Dukkha, of pain. Suddenly someone realises there is no point to being alive. All life ends in death. I'm alive, all that means is I've got this decaying, messy body and it's going to get sick and then it's going to die and that's it and there's no point to it at all. So what do I do? I get diagnosed with some kind of psychiatric condition and I get the appropriate treatment. If the Buddha had been around in contemporary Western society, he would not have left home to become enlightened. He would have been sent to a psychiatrist and he would have spent the rest of his life on drugs. <laughs> it's not the experience, it's the meaning of the experience. That is what can transform a life. I recognise, oh, all the things that I thought meant something. They don't. Really, they don't. And so the psychiatrist or the therapist can come along and say, oh, no, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong. They really do, they really do, they, they really do mean something. Or you can go to the ruthless Buddhist teacher and say, congratulations, you saw that. Very good. You saw that fundamentally the only meaning there is in human life is what human beings construct. Because everything is constructed. Now for the next step. <laughs> it's time to move on from there. Don't cling to that view. Clinging to that view is just Clinging and clinging causes suffering. Let it go and let's step on. Let's take the next step and then the next step and the next step. So through dukkha we go to anatta, for example. What the dharma gives is this sense of meaning of how it all fits in and therefore how it changes the way that we live. To transform a life, it's not good enough to have certain kinds of experience we have to be able to fit them into a framework of meaning and that transforms the way that we live. So this is the tracking of the Dharma, the understanding of the Dharma, singular. Then we get the tracking or the contemplation of the Dharmas, plural. Sometimes they say Dhamma and sometimes Dharma. I hope you're not being confused. I prefer the word Dharma because it's an English word. It's now in the English dictionary. So I'll speak English and say Dharma instead of Pali and saying Dhamma. The tracking of the Dharmas, plural. 
what this refers to is recognizing that everything we experience is just empty phenomena that comes and goes according to conditions. It's the maturity of the practice. It's a different way of viewing the world. We talked about how the Buddha's way of looking at the world is a first person view. He's looking at it from the point of view of experience. Now this is the view of the dharmas. We tend to live in a third person view, which is the world of science. So I'll give an example. If, if we take this and we say, what is it? Well, it's a glass mug and what's inside it? It's water. From a third person perspective, our ordinary everyday point of view, this mug of water is separate from me. It does not depend upon me for its existence. This mug existed happily at SBS before I came here and it will live after I leave. And this mug can be studied. We can do a scientific analysis of the glass. We can do a scientific analysis of the water in the glass. And we can weigh it, measure it, and so on. So this is our ordinary, everyday world that we live in. This is a mug of water. If we look at it from the point of view of the dharmas, what is it? It's this. That's what it is. Seeing is a dharma. Reaching is a dharma. Touching is a dharma. Lifting is a dharma. Bringing is a dharma. Tilting is a dharma. Tasting is a dharma. Swallowing is a dharma. Placing is a dharma. Hearing is a dharma. Satisfaction is a dharma. These are events, experienced events. Now you notice the connection if you do Mahasi practice, you notice exactly what's going on, don't you? Seeing, wanting, reaching, touching, lifting, tasting, etc. All the noting that we do. That is training ourselves to see the world as dharmas. If you note, let's say you're doing walking meditation and you're noting, lifting, pushing, placing, touching, Seeing, thinking, lifting, pushing, thinking, etc. You go up and down for 45 minutes doing this consistently. All of these events are taking place. What's missing? You. It's not me walking up and down. It's lifting, pushing, placing. Thinking, wanting, boredom, interest, etc. It's not me. I have disappeared. It's just a whole series of events. And so in that training, we're training ourselves to perceive the world as dharmas. It's basic boot camp training. And at some point, it starts to connect and we really do start seeing the world as simply dharmas, as phenomena that come and go according to conditions. And that completely transforms the way that we live. Because we find ourselves living in a different world. We find I am not who I thought I was, and this world is not what I thought it was. It's completely different. One of the ways that transformation happens when we do the practice is that sometimes it seems that it's not so much that I change as the world changes. It's a different world that I live in now. The world itself is different. We perceive it as this world of dharmas, of events coming and going according to conditions. And this is the world 
of what the Buddha calls dependent arising, also what he calls anatta, also what he calls emptiness, sunyata. And all of these teachings are different, different ways of looking at experiencing in that way. So when we actually starts to happen, when we genuinely start to forget ourselves, there's just the walking, there's just the speaking, there's just the feeling, there's just the thinking. There's no one here who is seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking. This is the maturity of the Satipatthana practice. This is where it all comes into, into fruition. But when you, when you recognise that, you also recognise that it's essentially the same as the practice at the very beginning. At the very beginning of the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha says, the practitioner lives tracking body as body, tracking mind as mind, body as body, mind as mind. It's just this. It's just this event that comes and goes according to conditions. This is why the first rule in this practice is never take it personally. Whatever it is, don't take it personally because it is not personal. This is fundamental. But to recognise that, actually to recognise it changes the whole, changes the way that we live. One of my main teachers uh, was a man called John Hale who I often tell this story, he died of motor neuron disease. This meant that he had this disease in which he progressively lost movement in the body and it started up in one of the shoulders, so it was predominantly up here. And if you can't move a muscle, it just wastes away. And if a muscle wastes away, then you have bone rubbing on bone. After some time, it's, you get chronic pain. So he was living with chronic pain but continuing to practice and even to teach uh, retreats. And when you would look at him, you would never know that he was in pain. And he never took a painkiller. And one, one time he was teaching this retreat outside of Sydney and different people came to visit him. And one of the visitors was a man from Sydney who was a psychologist, a Buddhist psychologist, who was specialising in pain management and he was very interested in John's pain management scheme because it was obviously very successful and he said how do you do it, what's your method and John said I just don't take it personally and that was it that was his pain management method <laughs> pain is just pain it's not me. Fundamentally, it's got nothing to do with me. It's just pain. That's all. He had a, a deep understanding of anatta, but it comes out of this practice. What we're training ourselves to do from the very beginning is just to see this experience as just this experience. That's all. Body is just body. Pain is just pain. Wanting is just wanting. Seeing is just seeing. Thinking is just thinking. That's all. That's all. That's all. Radically simple. But of course we keep adding extra onto it. No, no, no. It's not just thinking. It's my thinking. And it's really, really important because it's all about me and what's going to happen next. And that's really important. And I'm not being selfish here because... What I do will affect all these others. So it involves the whole world. It's even more important. No, it's just a thought. <laughs> and it comes and it goes. That's all. So this radical simplicity, and we train at it from the very beginning, as the practice matures, we begin to recognise what it's all about. And this will transform a life.